We are so grateful that you chose this Sunday to be with us. I've said this uh, at least a hundred times. There's a lot of things you can do on a Sunday morning, a lot of things, but you chose to be here. And that, that speaks something that does to our worship team. Guys, we love y'all. Thank you so much for leading us in worship today. Gabe, a pleasure to have you today, my friend. Thank you all so much. Um, Bishop and Pastor Pam are out of town, and um, they, have, they have left the reins to me. <laughs> my goal is just not burn the place down. That's my whole goal. No, they have taken some much, much much-deserved time off, and so we bless them. We'll be seeing them soon. And uh, guys, we have, we have, it's it's hard to believe we've come into the month of February. Now, mark my words, mark my words, in about 73 days, we're going to be celebrating Christmas again. (laughs) Mark my words. You laugh. You laugh. And y'all laughed at me last year when I said it. But Christmas showed up, and I said, who's laughing now? Oh, this thing of time. Buddy, it's going, isn't it? It's going. It's just clicking on by. But there's so much much promise in every year of life God gives us. As the song said, if I'm still alive, he's not done with me. I want to tell you this morning, do not have a spirit of fear this year. What you encounter, what you go through, what you face, don't face it with fear. Face it with the faith in God. I can't figure out my problems. I can't figure out my solutions. But I know the God who can. And he's been faithful to me, and he's shown himself true. Man, this has already been the year of of God opening the door at the exact moment it needs to be opened. I would love, I would love, Sister Dorita, if the door was open three months before I needed it to be open. I love looking down a long hallway and knowing the door's already open. But he's the kind of God who says, trust me. I want you to come in relationship with me. Relationship says, I'm going to open the door when it needs to be open. I think of my kids all the time. My relationship with God, I, I reflect back on the relationship of my kids with me. They have no doubt daddy's going to take care of it. They can be running towards the edge of the bed and they know daddy's going to put his hand out and catch them. And man, let me tell you, if that doesn't testify to you on how we should look at our relationship with God, it's the exact same thing. I don't know how he's going to do it. It's not me to have the mind of God and figure everything out. I just know somehow He's going to do it. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're kicking off a series today. I want you to open up your Peace Church apps. Listen, if you've not downloaded the app yet, download it. Please download it. It's very, very uh, a big part of our church. And um, you can click on the notes tab and follow along with me in the notes. But we're kicking off the series today called Love Defined, Love Defined. And what we're wanting to do today and for the next three weeks is define, hello, Moto. I know so one of y'all got a Motorola and need to turn that thing off. I heard the, oh, hello, Moto. For this week and the next three weeks, We're going to be defining love biblically. I'm talking, we're getting down to the core of what God means when he says love. Now, yes, we're in the month of February. It's hard to believe Valentine's Day is here. If you ask me, a lot of these holidays are just a a scheme to get money out of us. But I'll take it. I'll take it. But we want to hit on true love because love is not some box of chocolates in a prefab heart-shaped red box. Love very possibly might be some chocolate-covered strawberries, though. Just saying. 
love. I want us to open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28. We're going to go through verse 31, and it says this here. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Everybody say, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. That's good. That's good. Verse 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all, all, everybody say all, all. your heart and with all, all. your soul and with all. all, your mind and with all. all, your strength. That's a lot of all. That's a whole lot of all. In verse 31, in the second they didn't even ask what the second. Jesus just, he just owns them right here. Because in the second is this. You shall love your neighbor, get this, as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no other commandment greater than these. Whew. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We love all kinds of things, don't we? Oh, let me tell you some things I love. I love a good crawfish boil. Brother Sinisaw, minister to my soul, brother. Crawfish boil. The potatoes and the corn. Hey, let's throw a little sliced onion in there. Why not throw mushrooms in there as well? Maybe a boiled egg? I lost some of y'all on that one. Crawfish boil. I love it. You want to put me in a good mood? Give me a crawfish boil. I love crawfish. I love, um, I love uh, being with lighthearted people. I love being in the company of people who laugh. Man, you get with a good group of people. It doesn't have to be a whole lot. Give me three or four people that are just fun, love to laugh, love to enjoy life, and laugh at the things that deserve to be laughed at. There's a lot of things we can, we can uh, either take as painful and, and, man, I'm going through it, or we can laugh it off. Laughter is a wonderful medicine. I love being around people who are lighthearted and love to laugh. Um, we love designer clothes. We love designer shoes. We love um, the latest technology. I had a roommate, and... Every time a new phone came out, he had to get the phone. Blew my mind. Couldn't eat. Couldn't afford food. But had the latest phone with the most storage on it. We love technology. We love going fishing. We love shopping at the mall. Boy, do we love a lot of things. I love seafood. I love shrimp. I love crab. I love fish. I love these things. But do I really love those shrimp? Do I really love that filet of fish? When I say I love fish, when I love shrimp, when I say I love crab and crawfish, do I really love them? Because if I love them, would I be eating them? True love would release it back into the water from whence it came. Love says, I want you to live, baby. Go live. I love you. No, nah, I don't love them, to be honest with you. I love what they do for me. When 
when I say I love crawfish, I could care less about its life. Actually, I don't want it to live. I want it in my belly. So I don't love it. I really love myself. Do I really love, do I really love the latest pair of Nikes? Do I love them? If I love them, I wouldn't be walking on them. No, I love the endorphins in my body thinking I've got a brand that everyone adores. And now I'm conditioned to adore that brand. Look, there's nothing wrong with loving things. The way that we in English say we love something. No, a lot of these things are, are pleasurable. But what it does is it's saying, I love me. I love these things for how it makes me feel. What, what it triggers inside me. The serotonin and all these good things that start flowing when, when we partake and get these things in our lives. Can I even say this concerning relationships? There's some people I enjoy being around because of how they make me feel. Because if they changed, I wouldn't be with them anymore. Just honest. Just being very honest. You ever had somebody you enjoyed, then all of a sudden it's like something changed in them? You're like, I don't want to be around them, man. They're a Debbie Downer for real. They're just, whoo, I, I, I just don't like that. No. Because it's not feeding us any longer. And this, in English, is how we've conditioned the word love. Love is all about what it can do for us. Are we getting it this morning? Amen. Amen. So what ends up happening is, is love isn't about the other person. My love for them is really aimed right back at me. Two months ago, we had a, a series titled The Coming Christ. This was the month of December, and, and we're building up to Christmas the birth of Christ. And so the whole month, we start preaching about the coming Christ, how everything in the Bible points to Jesus. A lot of us in this room were here for that series. Listen, we have a lot of new members. Praise God. Praise God. So many new members. I'm so, my heart is just so overwhelmed with joy for this. And so there is a good, good handful of us that weren't part of that series. But we got, into, um, we got into the Hebrew language and defining how, how the language of God really works. And I want us to do a brief recap on Hebrew today and because uh, we're getting into the Hebrew word for love. We're going to show this on the screens pretty soon, but we're going to be talking about the Hebrew word for love. But the first image we see up here is uh, from our series called The Coming Christ. Now, Hebrew is an incredibly deep language. It's not just a, a language of letters. Uh, we're very familiar in the languages we speak of just having letters. And those form pronunciations, and we can get whole words out of that pronunciation. Hebrew is, is different. Um, Hebrew is, it's a numerical system, it's a letter system, and it's, it's as well uh, pictographically, pictographically. There's not often times I use a five-syllable word. That was one of them. It's a pictograph language as well. So it has pictures assigned to it, it has a letter, and then it also has a numerical value for each, for each letter as well. So if the letter A, which is Aleph, um, let me show you where Aleph is at here. This is Aleph. This is the first letter in the Bible. Number one letter. So it has the numerical value number one. So if you're going to write number one in Hebrew, you would write Aleph. You wouldn't use a number one like we do. And so the letters are also the numbers. And uh, this, this goes incredibly deep. Uh, on levels we can't even comprehend, um, the Hebrew word for snow is shaleg, shaleg. 
Now, it's three letters. The three letters, the first one is shin. We get the sh from shin, the letter. Its numerical value is 300. It holds the value 300. And then you have a second letter, lamid. Its numerical value is 30. And then you have gimel, which is three. Three letters form the, the word for snow in Hebrew. Well, why is this important? We have these series of threes going on in snow. What is snow? When you think of snow, when you think scientifically of snow, snow is the contracting of water. The molecules, the element of water contracting, it was something big and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter until it becomes a snowflake. So what we end up seeing in Hebrew, the very first language that ever was, the language of God, is the first letter in Hebrew has the numerical value 300. The next letter has the numerical value 30. And the last letter has the numerical value 3. And so it's a contraction taking place within the word. Isn't this mind-blowing? We see things shrinking down just as snow shrinks down. And this is all the DNA of Christ. And so we, we, uh, we talked in the month of December about pregnancy, the word pregnant. Pregnant, the numerical value of that word is 271. Why is that important? Well, the, the gestation period from conception to birth is nine months and one day. Nine months plus one day is 271 days. And so it's all of these things over and over in the language of God. Let me tell you something. If God gives you a word, you have to understand he's not just giving you a word to answer your, your problem or your need. He's got multiple, multiple answers wrapped up in the one word he gave you. If you've been praying for something and you know God has spoken to you and said, baby, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. I've got it taken care of. Have an insurance in God. Have the assurance he's got it taken care of. And then on top of it, many layers deep within his word, he's got multiple answers for other things you're going through. And so we see this spiritually, but we have to understand also, naturally, his word is no different than the spiritual implication. And so what do we see here in, in Hebrew? What do we see here? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, it's the word berashit, 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 in the beginning. And so the first two letters here actually form a word of its own. This is a word of its own. It means son. The letter bet has the symbol for house or a tent. This right here is the human head. It means one of authority. It means one of, of high rank, a person. So you have, this means son. The head of the house in Hebrew is son. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that really interesting? Because within the son lies the future generations. So really, the son holds all authority. See how that works? So here we have a full word, but within this word is another word. This is son. Aleph, uh, which by the way, bet is the number two in Hebrew. Aleph is number one. Bet is two. This is where we get our English word alphabet from. Alphabet. The first two letters in Hebrew form alphabet. This is the God letter. It's the holy letter. It's the letter they say somehow it's silent, and I, I still can't figure that out. Uh, but it's so holy, it's assigned to God. And it's got the symbol of an ox, all-powerful, strong, might, authority. The ox is the symbol for God. Letter shin, is, uh, it means destruction. That is, those are devouring teeth right there, destructive teeth. It'll all consume, it will devour, it will destroy. This is the letter Yud. Yud is the smallest of all the letters. Ironically, it's what so many of the names of God start with. Yahweh, Yeshua, um, all of its tiny letter. It doesn't reach the top, nor does it reach the bottom. Just the bottom. It just hangs there, right in the middle. Yud is an outstretched open hand. And then Tav, or Tav, is the... It's, it's a mark. All it is is your mark. It's a stamp. It's a seal. It means even if you're illiterate, you can put a mark down. 
Now, isn't it something that it's also the cross? So what are we seeing here in Hebrew? To, just to recap, this is a good recap for those of us who went through this in December and for the new ones. What are we seeing this tell us? The very first words in the Bible, in the beginning, Berashit, what are we seeing? We're seeing that all things point to Jesus. Because it says right here that the Son of God, the God letter Aleph, the Son of God, was destroyed by the willing open hand on the cross. I said this in December. I'll say it again. You cannot make this up. This is the power of the word of God. Don't doubt the power of the word of God. Don't doubt the importance when somebody gives you a prophetic word, when somebody says they're praying for you. Sweetheart, there is so much in the word of God that when it is spoken, creation and prophecy are built into it and in levels we don't understand. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Mark chapter 12 with verse 30 again. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment. There's no other commandment greater than these. These are the greatest commandments. Now, are y'all okay if we do some more teaching? Is this okay with y'all? Let, let's get into some, some teaching of the word this morning. And so the second image that I want us to put up here is the image of the Hebrew word for love. The Hebrew word for love. And so what we see in the Hebrew word for love, it is a three-letter word as well. Three letters in the word love. Now, the numerical value of this word, you have, once again, you have the God letter, Aleph. The first letter, you see there? Aleph. And then you have, let's go ahead and skip five and come to two. The second letter is bait or vait, depending on the word. It depends on how it's pronounced. So you have this, you have this one and this two, and this one and this two are connected by the fifth letter in the alphabet. And that fifth letter is called, hey. <laughs> like, seriously, look at the guy. This is the symbol for the letter hey. Does it not look like he's going, hey. <laughs> I got such a kick when I was looking at the Hebrew alphabet. And I, I, I said, you got to be kidding me. A guy throwing his hands up is going, hey. Hey. So the, this number one and this number two are connected by this number five, hey. Now remember, the one represents God, all powerful, the all sovereign. And number two, bait is always associated with son. It's the house right here. Bait is always tied into son somehow. And so you have a number one and you have a number two, and this five is joining them together. Now, before we define all of this about love, let's look at the numerical value of love. Love, ahav, ahav, love. What, for all of us mathematicians, what is one plus five? Why are y'all so hesitant? <laughs> Come on. One plus five. Six. There you go. What is six? Plus two. Man, y'all are smart. Eight. We have a number eight right here. Now, eight is significant in the Bible. Pastor Mark, eight represents new beginnings. If you're following along in your app, number eight represents new beginnings. Something new takes place. And isn't it true when we go through a Sunday through a Saturday, or for us Americans, we're very conditioned a Monday through Sunday, right? How many times have we said in our own lives, I am so glad that week is behind me. 
Lord, I am thankful for the Monday that's coming. Monday can't get here fast enough. My God have mercy. There's something about the passing of a seven-day week that when we step into the, the eighth day, all things are new. There's just something about that. It's a new opportunity for something. It's a new birth. It's, it's, there's a promise to an eight that we know we haven't experienced before. Eight. Eight is new beginnings. Now, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty powerful for the word love because when love comes into the picture, something new is birthed. See how this works together. Eight introduces something new, and all of that happens through ahav, through love. So now we look at, we know what this means, and we know what this means, but let's look at this letter hey and see what it means. Hey is significant because it's a, it, it means to reveal, to expose, to hold nothing back. And literally, it's almost like this guy is flashing us right now. He's holding nothing back. Why do we lift up our hands when, when, when the authority comes to us? Why do we lift up our hands when law enforcement comes? It's to reveal we don't have anything. It's, look, I'm open. I'm exposed. I'm not doing anything. You, look, this is it. I'm showing you everything right here. Hands up. It's a sign of revealing. Hey represents revelation. It represents, um, it represents also giving. Because there's no greater form of revealing something to somebody than to give them something. The very first time we see this letter, hey, used in a, in a strong word in the Bible is for the word give. Give. The first time give is mentioned as a strong word in the Bible, it starts with the letter hey. So hey is always associated with giving as well. So what is this telling us? We've got all of this interesting stuff about language. All this stuff that we're not going to use tomorrow or the next day. But it's important to know what God is speaking to us. What this says is love. Y'all ready for this? If y'all ready for this, say, well. well. Love is when one reveals and gives to two. Wow. Love is when one opens up and gives to two. A complete revelation, a complete here I am. I'm not holding anything back. Love is when you have no agenda whatsoever other than to give. That's it. Love is always an action, and it is giving. Love is not there to take. Love is there to simply give. Whether two reciprocates and gives back, that's up to two. But for me as one... I'm going to do what love calls for, which is one to give to two. And for two, two says, I'm number one, and I, through the same access of five, through the same hey, I'm going to give to one. Now, what's, what is so significant about this letter? It, the letter hey is, it means to reveal, to give. Now, now, look at this space right here. This space is pretty important. Because this represents a window. This is a window right here. So it has the image of revelation, but the second image assigned to it is also a window. And so what do we know about windows in Scripture? Well, what does Malachi 3 tell us? Trust me. Put me to the test. Bring your tithe, the whole tithe, into the, into the storehouse, and I will open the what? The windows. And pour out a blessing. The windows of blessings come out of windows. And so there is a blessing when one gives to two. There's new life when one gives to two. Are, are you with me this morning? Hearing this. 
I know this is geeking out on some weird Hebrew stuff, but this is super powerful if we're going to honestly walk in love because so many of us walk in love with a selfish motive. And I've caught myself for so much of my life walking with a selfish motive when, with love when love has no agenda whatsoever. Love says, you don't have to love me for me to love you. God pre-programmed it in his own tongue to line up to say, love simply gives. And whatever happens, happens. That's love. Now let's look at John 3.16 once again. Remember, Aleph is the God letter. Aleph, number one. The number two is assigned to the Son. That letter. Let's look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You see how this works? You can't, you can't make this up. And through love, through this right here, through this right here, you see the connection with the Son and the Father, that they are one through love. God says, I am love. This is who I, you can't, you can't tear me apart. You can't dissect me. I am love. Because what ends up happening when one loves and gives to two, they become one. There's no separation between the two. There is no separate identity in love. Love says, I will take you on as myself. Remember to love your neighbor as yourself. What ends up happening through this, through this right here, one and two become the same number. No separation between the two. My God, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Marriage, let's talk about marriage for a moment because marriage, marriage is when one promises, I make a vow for myself. Listen, when I stood at the altar and I made a vow to my wonderful, beautiful wife, Carissa, I could not make a vow for her. I can only make a vow for me. And when I stood at the altar, I made a vow that I will love. That's my position. I can be up there, and I can say as one, I promise to love two. And then she said as one, I promise to love two. What ends up happening through that God covenant, through that God connection, we have now become one. See how that works. This is, this is God's plan. This is his divine plan right here. Let's show the third image now. The third image. This is, this is the word for man and the word for woman. And the word for man is simply ish. Ish. Word for woman is isha. Man has the letter aleph, yud, and shin, or sin. Which, by the way, our word for sin comes from the letter sin. Remember what this represented? Destructive teeth tearing down. Destroying sin. And so what we have here, man is Aleph, Yud, in, in sin. Woman is, is uh, Aleph, Shin, and hey. There's that, there's that letter hey again. Hey. Hey, girl. Hey. Now, man has two letters that it shares with woman. The Aleph and the Shin. The Aleph and the Shin. But man possesses what's called yud. And woman possesses what's called hay. So we have a yud hay. There's a yud hay here. Yud hay, which is a name of God. That's where we get the pronunciation Yahweh. So through love, come on somebody. Through love... Through what God has ordained, through what you have come in covenant with him on, when man and woman come together, they bring Yahweh into the midst of them. Woo! I was nervous for a while, y'all, if y'all were going to clap or not. This was... Because I geeked out at my desk. I'm th I kept standing up saying, God, you got to be kidding me. This is beautiful. 
So now Ish has met up with Isha, and now they've come together, and God is in the midst of them. This is all through covenant, through covenant love. Love has brought this union together. The one and the two now have God in the midst of them. Doesn't this remind you of a scripture we often use for prayer, but it's assigned to so much more for prayer, where two or three are in, uh, gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them? Look, I know this is a, we're talking right now about, about man and woman and marriage and all of this. Yes, the principles to all of this apply to so many of us, whether we're married or not married. The principles apply to this. So what we have here is yud Hey Yahweh. Now what happens, what happens if we take out God Right here. Let's remove the yud and the hay. Let's show the next image that removes them. So when we take out yud and hay, we end up getting aleph and shin. Aleph and shin. They form the same word when you take God out. And what is that word? Fire. Aleph and shin spell the word fire. Fire. And so what we end up doing is saying, you know what? We can have relationship and we don't have to include God in it. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? But let's keep God out of the mix. We're going to do our own thing. We know, how, we know how it goes. We can form our own house. We can do what we want, but we're not going to include God in it. Listen, when you take out God in relationship, it's one fire meeting another fire. And when you have two fires come together, that is a big fire. Do we find it coincidental that we say, man, she is so hot-headed? My God, I could kill him sometimes. The moron is such a hothead. Why is that that we use terms like I'm burning with anger? Why do we use things like I'm at the boiling over point? My, my rage is boiling over. You think it's coincidence that we come up with all of these words to explain that we're upset and that God is not in the middle of our situation? No, because when you remove God from man and you remove God from woman, all we're left with is fire. It was on my own doing. This wasn't God that did this to me. He said, if you keep me in the mix of everything, baby, there's going to be, there's going to be blessings and there's going to be love and there's going to be abundance more than you, you ever could ask for. I'm going to abundantly bless. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. Can he do some stupid things sometimes? Yes. Yes, he can. But does love conquer all? Yes. And so when we pull God out, we're left with fire. Now, this is an interesting little thing here that I saw. Uh, remember, Aleph is God, and this is sin. Isn't it something how God deals with sin with fire? That's just, that was something real interesting I, I just picked up on, and I go, that's, that's something. Because he never wanted that for you and I. He never desired that for you and I. He didn't want us to, to, to cause heartache on ourselves. He didn't want us to, to burn in our own desires and burn with our own uh, fleshly desires and, and have it consume us. He wanted to be in the mix of it all. He wanted to be in the mix of it all. I want you, if you can, uh, Sister Carissa, if you could put the last image back up, the third image. Man possesses this letter right here. Man possesses yud. Woman possesses hay. Now, this is, this is so incredible because 
Yud is an outstretched hand. It's, it's, it's a giving of something. It's, a, it's a, a willingness, an open hand to give something. But Yud, look, look at where it's positioned. It, it doesn't reach the top. It doesn't meet the top, nor does it come to the bottom. It's hanging in limbo right here. And the significance of this is, is that Yud represents a thought. Yud represents also a dream, a vision. There's, there's, there's this, this seed that man has. There's this promise of something, yet it's not tangible. It's, it's, it's there, it's prophetic, that something can happen through man. He's created in the image of God, and he possesses the yud. He possesses this, this, this future of something, yet it's not tangible at all. It's just there. You ever had a good idea and didn't turn it into something? Man, I've had ideas about inventions, and then... 12 years later, somebody invents it, and you kick yourself, and you see it on the shelf, and you go, that could have been me. Well, see, it was a yud. It was a thought. It was a dream. It was potential. There was potential here, but potential, if you're following along in your notes, potential is nothing until you make it something. So what man possesses is a potential great future. But what he has to do is man has to come with woman. And with woman, now the letter hey is a combination. You see this yud? That yud is right here. It's the letter yud. And this right angle is the letter dalit. Dalit is a door in Hebrew. Yud is a hand. And so when you combine dalit and yud, you get hey. And so what ends up happening is the hand is opening the door for the yud to manifest into this world. This is why relationship is only between woman and man. Only. It's the way it is, bro. Don't blame me. Don't don't get mad at me that... Ah, uh, you're, you're, you're just one of them old school heart. No, I'm doing nothing but preaching God's word. This is his word right here. This is it. It all, oh, <laughs> this only works, y'all, between man and woman. Because man possesses the thought, the dream, the potential of something great. It's the potential of generations. Listen, some of the, some of the, I've, I've sat down and talked with my wife. I, did, I wasn't even looking for counsel. I did not go to her for counsel whatsoever. I'm just in a rare moment where I open up and talk at home. I talk and she says, well, baby, what you need to do is go talk to so-and-so. And then because they have this and they're also connected with that business and that's how it's going to make this happen. And I go... That is so incredible. And I walk away and I'm, I'm, I'm a little angry at myself for how stupid I am. Why didn't I think of that? Jared, you could have thought of that. No, I couldn't have. Why? Because I brought a seed. It was just a thought. It was just a dream. It was something that, it was a potential something. And then with her being the hay, which is Dalit and Yud put together, the door, she put her hand on the door and brought the idea, the dream to pass. Thank you so much, my sister. I believe it's good too. Hey. Hey is the doorway. It's the manifestation. Listen, God's plan for something to manifest on earth is for man and woman to come together and bring forth fruit. The reason why your relationship will prosper is because one will always celebrate two. And two is not in competition with one. They don't compete with each other. My wife is much more intelligent than me. She starts talking about things and I'm just like, I'm like one plus one is two and you lost me after that babe 
I'm not in competition with, I celebrate the fact that my wife is great with numbers. I celebrate the fact that she's good with business, that she can handle the house and she can handle, as the administrative pastor here, handle the funds that God has brought into this house with excellence and conviction. This woman's intelligent, so I celebrate her, not compete against her. Because she is the hay to the yud. For real, Brother Michael. Without hay, all I am is, is, is just a, a potential something. And there's been too many of us, and this applies to all of us, man and woman. Too many of us have allowed us to just be an idea and never team up with the people of God to make it a reality. Listen, get plugged in to church. Get plugged into a peace group where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst of them. He's going to be there in the midst of them. And you're going to start seeing things come forth and seeing, seeing things birth. One of the greatest pleasures of my life is to help somebody. I love helping people. It's, it's just so fulfilling to help them. I've come to realize by helping people and genuinely loving them, you make a lot of connections. You build a lot of bridges. You don't burn bridges when you help. Genuinely love people. Build some bridges. Make some connections. God's in the middle of all of this. Let's put that image up one more time, guys. One more time, the, the image number three. So here we have Yud. Yud. It's, it's the outstretched hand. It's the giving of something. It's the idea. Have you ever thought or have you ever seen somebody go like this? I got it now. Why do we do that? We go, I have an idea. Or, oh, oh. Seriously. We do all of these things we don't realize we're doing, but it's programmed within our DNA. It is the Yud inside all of us. It's the God part of us that says there's creation. There's something that I'm wanting to do in your life, but I need you to team up with my people, with the body of Christ, and give birth to these great things. The door, the hand that opens the door for the seed right here to come through. Even God is held to his own word. God is held to this principle right here because if Mary said no to the angel, there would be no Messiah that came forth. We often think Mary's pre-programmed to say yes. No, 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 no. No. Mary was not pre-programmed. She had 100% free will to say yes or no to the plan of God. But if God who had the Yud, remember this is a spiritual, it's a spiritual letter as well. It's the name that Yeshua, Jesus, starts with Yud. The very name Jesus is Yud. And God could not bring Jesus into this world unless a hey said, be it unto me according to your word. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let it be so. Let's all stand this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, says this right here. There is no fear. Everybody say, no fear. No fear. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You want to know what perfect love is, love perfected? Perfected love is when all the letters of love are there. You have to include every letter in love. Keep God in the middle of your covenant with him. Keep him in the middle of your promise. Don't forget what you've told God. Don't forget what you've promised to God. Don't forget what you have spoken to God. Keep love and God in the middle of it and watch if he does not bless you. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray right now that you perfect love in each one of us. God, let love be perfected in us.
Not for selfish agenda, God. I'm not here to do anything of my own accord other than to simply love you. God, if you never did another thing for me, I'm still going to love you. And God, help me in that daily process. It's easy to say these words, God. It's real easy to say these words. But God, on the daily, when I feel abandoned, on the daily, God, when I'm not feeling any love, God, when everybody's turned their back on me, when I feel like the whole world has turned against me, God, let my heart be positioned to always say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, we put you, we put you at the forefront of all things. You are the center of all things. God, you keep all things in balance together. God, if we pull you out of this earth, it will utterly fall apart and be destroyed by fire. But God, as long as we're here, your children, then you're going to be in the middle of us. In the name of Jesus. I pray over our relationships right now. Over our relationships. There's some of us, I've talked with multiple families this week that have wayward daughters, wayward sons. We've got sons and daughters that are in marriages that aren't producing fruit. We have sons and daughters that are going through a tough time. They're spiritually dry, spiritually bankrupt, and they're just going through the motions, getting through life. Let's pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. God, over the grown children, over the grown sons and daughters, God, I pray love, love just overwash them, God. Overpower them. Come over them, Lord God. Saturate them completely. God, I pray you use us, the family members, to be the conduits for that love. To do nothing else than just pour out genuine God to them. Not to judge them, not to point the finger at them, but to be there in love and have no agenda. Because God, through that love, you're going to bring the sons and daughters back home. God, I'm seeing them filled once again with your presence and overflowing with your spirit, God. I'm seeing sons and daughters prophesy and speak in tongues again, Lord. I'm seeing the overflow and the abundance of your love taking over, God. Right now, we proclaim it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, I pray over our marriages. Begin to, if you're here with your spouse, I want you to hold the hand of your spouse right now. If you're engaged to be married, hold the hand of that person. If you're here with a family member and you're not married, hold their hand and proclaim this over your family. Proclaim this over your marriage. In the name of Jesus, as for our house, as for our house, it shall be called the house of the Lord. And love shall abide in the name of Jesus. And love shall prosper in the name of Jesus. And God, I, I refuse to have, begin to proclaim this. I refuse to have strife and arguing and bickering and all of these things that are not of you in the house. God, as man and as woman, we're going to keep you center in the middle of us, God. I come against right now the enemy by the name of Jesus. Satan, we speak against you. We speak against every hellish henchman that you have assigned to our families. And we say, you shall not prosper. You will not prosper. Perfect love has cast out all fear. And so Jesus, when you're in the midst, perfection is there. Perfection is with us. And we proclaim that right now. We proclaim it over our marriages. We proclaim it over our families, God. My children will serve the Lord. My mother, my father will serve the Lord. My grandparents will serve the Lord. God, my marriage, we're going to serve the Lord. I pray over my cousins and over my nephews and my nieces, God. I pray all, I call them out by name. You're going to serve the Lord in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let it be so. Let it be so. Oh, thank you, God. Let's worship together.